something of substance that will outlast us. That's really what this series of messages is all about. It's called Beyond. And all of November we are moving beyond. Beyond BFA was the first message and it was about how we can move beyond the four walls of our church. And then the next week was beyond uh, Buckeye, beyond the town of Buckeye into the state of Arizona. Today I want to talk with you uh, along the lines of beyond borders, reaching out to the nations. And then don't forget, of course, next week is the Faith Promise Rally to infinity and beyond. It's going to be one of the highlights of the year, and I hope you will plan to be here. There is a theme verse that goes along with this series of messages, and it's Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, and it reads like this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be witnesses. Catch that. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the ends of the earth. That's God's missions diagram his plan for world evangelization beyond borders. Today, our story shifts scenes again. Remember, week one was the upper room. It was uh, the Last Supper, the Lord with His disciples. It was the Last Supper, but it was also the First Communion, very special event. And then uh, last week, week number two, took place in the Garden of Gethsemane the oil press. I told you that Jesus' soul was crushed. His spirit prevailed over what his flesh was feeling. The battle was won in the prayer garden. But next week will be the last of the three G's. And I hope you'll be back next Sunday as we talk about Golgotha. But today's story is all about Jesus appearing before Pilate at a place called Gabatha. Now, uh, Pilate, don't get mixed up over words here and don't do like I did recently. Stephanie and I were driving in the car and we're going past a strip mall and I, I looked over and read the name of a business and um, I, I was confused by the title of the business. I, I said to her, what is that place? She said, which one? I said, that one right there, what's that all about? She said, I don't know which one you're talking about. And I said, that one right there that's called Yoga and Pilots. <laughs> and she did just like you're doing. She laughed. And she said, that says Yoga and Pilates. <laughs> that, Keith, is a form of exercise. Obviously, something I know nothing about, right? So, um, so don't get confused. We're not talking about Pilates this morning. We're talking about Pilot. It's, um, it's all about Jesus appearing before Pilate. And today's story really takes place at a, a, a certain area that was referred to as Gabatha. Antonio Cicere painted this famous work. And uh, this picture that you're about to see on the screen is titled Eke Homo. It's a Latin phrase that means this is the man. Or behold the man. This is that moment when Pilate points to Jesus and has mocked him to the crowd. And I think Antonio Cicere captured that beautifully. You get a sense of how spectacular the palace must have been. How ornate and how, how fancy it must have been. And this place where all of this takes place is in what's called the Praetorium on the western hillside of Jerusalem. And it's an area, like I said, that's called Gabatha. Gabatha was a raised platform. Gabatha was a, an elevated platform where there was this judgment seat called Bema. It was Pilate's 
judgment seat. He sat there to take, to take cases. And he sat on that seat to make decisions. It was the judge's bench of the ancient world. Gabbatha is a preview of the true Bema. You see, because Paul talks twice in his writings about the Bema seat, the judgment seat, the judgment seat of Christ. And not only that, but John, who wrote the Revelation, he also talks about the Bema, the judgment. Pilate's Bema is nothing compared to Jesus' Bema. So when you read John chapter 19, realize it takes place in and around Pilate's Bema seat. John chapter 19, verse number 1, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Now it says two different things in the scripture. It says they twisted thorns together. This is so twisted. It says they slapped him in the face. <coughs> Pardon the pun. What a slap in the face. <coughs> this is horrible what they're doing to Jesus. Pilate is laughing it off. Pilate thinks if I can just make a big mockery of him, then that will appease the crowd and then it'll all be okay. And by the way, the same tactic is used to this day. There is still that same spirit of fear and insecurity. Lots of people think, if I can just bully people around, then I'll get my way. You might know some of them. But what's so amazing is that even though these soldiers are mocking Jesus, even though they're ridiculing Him, still they're speaking a profound truth when they say the words, Hell King of the Jews. And that is the first point this morning. Hail, King of the Jews. Jesus, He is the King of the Jews. He is the King of humanity. He is the King of kings. They were quite right, even though they were mocking in fact, a little bit later in the story, the Jewish leaders, they get made mad, they get angry about this because Pilate had an inscription written that said, King of the Jews. And he put it on, as a sign, tacked it, had them tack it up above Jesus' head on the cross. And, and they became so indignant, said, take that down or else change the wording of it. Don't let it say King of the Jews. Right on there, he claimed to be King of the Jews. But Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. King of the Jews. In fact, it was in three different languages as all of the nationalities descended upon Jerusalem into the Passover season. And there are thousands and thousands of people passing by and singing, seeing the title King of the Jews. So in the midst of this twisted injustice, in, in the middle of this mockery, which is so absolutely a slap in the face of everything that's holy and dignified, in the middle of this unrighteousness surfaces this truth, hell, king of the Jews. And I want to ask you this morning, have you acknowledged Jesus as your personal king? Do you know that Jesus is the king of kings? Reading on verse number 4 says this, Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. 
As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The second point, here is the man. Here is the man. Pilate says those words. Here is the man. It is that famous Latin phrase that I shared with you earlier, ecce homo, behold the man. It's the same phrase that impressed Antonio Ciceri to paint that magnificent painting. Pilate says, here is the man. Now, Pilate had no way of knowing how profound his words were. Even though he's an ungodly king, he's speaking words that have impact upon all of eternity. He's declaring something that is truly amazing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the theologian, thought long and hard about these very words. This is the man, or it might be translated, behold the man. He thought a lot about these very words, and here's what he came to the conclusion. He says the point is, Jesus is not the man. Jesus is not a man. But the emphasis needs to be this way. He is man. God is man. You see, this is the ultimate fulfillment of those words that were prophesied about Jesus. That his name will be called Emmanuel. God with us. So an evil king standing before the crowd doesn't realize how he is declaring a truth about, about Jesus. Here is the man. It might even be interpreted, Bonhoeffer said, it might be better interpreted that here is mankind. Here is humanity. Because our welfare, our existence rested upon Jesus in that moment. Whatever he determined to happen in that moment was going to have impact on all of humanity as the second Adam, the new one, came and experienced life from our point of view and became sin at that moment of sacrifice. Church history is filled with people who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Who believe that Jesus is the God-man. And they have gone beyond borders, sacrificed at great lengths to do whatever they could to get the message of Jesus out because they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. One family was uh, a missionary couple from the 1930s. Their names are Paul and Virginia Weidman. And their two little boys, Paul Jr. was five years old, and little Johnny was two years old when they were just an Assemblies of God couple, just loving Jesus at their church in the 1930s and felt God tugging at their heart to go and become missionaries. And they obeyed. They went to an area that present day is known as Burkina Faso. In, in that day, back then, it was a French territory. And they went way down south in the country to Tincomboto, a small village city, to begin their ministry. Because children always learn language so much faster than adults, uh, little Paul, who was five years old, picked up on the Maltzai language instantly. You see, they went to minister to the Maltzai tribes. These are warrior tribes. These are people who carry spears and clubs, and they are known to be violent. And it was a very dangerous setting. But here they are among them, and, and uh, little Paul 
Paul Jr., boy, he, he picks up the Maasai language like that, and it was just the most amazing thing. And so Big Paul would go out to preach, and he would take Little Paul with him. So he would preach in English, and when Little Paul was only six years old, he would interpret what his dad said and preach it to the Maasai. When he was seven years old, he got black water fever, and he died in two days from the point of being sick. Little Paul died. And he was so sick and, and so just dehydrated and, and in and out of delirium. And, and he, was, he was just fever hot, pitch hot with fever and just burning up. But in those last hours, he began to sing hymns in the Maasai language. And they called all of the people from the village in to his deathbed. And little Paul began to preach in the Maasai language. And with his dying words, he said, Don't follow Satan's road. Follow Jesus' road. That's the road that will take you to heaven. Seven years old. And then he died. His dad, Paul Sr., Shortly after little Paul passed away, his dad came down with dysentery, uh, dysentery and malaria. And he, he was, his, his body was ravaged by disease. It went on and on for months. It stretched well beyond a year. Raging fever, weak and no, no strength. Uh, his insides just being torn apart and sometimes having, uh, um, seeing things and, and envisioning things that weren't really there, just so sick. And it was during one of the most horrible times that he was so sick and raging with fever during the rainy season, in the night, literally, the house they were living in in Tincomboto, the roof caved in. In the middle of the night, the mud roof caved in on top of them. And so now, uh, his wife, Virginia, who is now pregnant, she helps her husband and gets her baby boy and takes them out to the truck and they drive for 200 miles through the night on muddy dirt roads, risking their welfare, going back to the capital city. After they got there and got him in a hospital and then uh, just a, a short while after that, she began having problems with her pregnancy. And, and the doctor said, if you don't stay in bed completely, I mean total bed rest, then you will lose this child. And so she did. It was for months. I suppose in ter current terminology, it would be ecclesia, uh, ecclesia. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. But she had... Eclampsia. Eclampsia. What is it? Eclampsia. Eclampsia. Thank Eclampsia. you. Eclampsia. Yeah, Eclampsia. So... She was deathly sick, and her husband was deathly sick. And they had lost their son, they had lost their house, and then two weeks before the baby was born, there was a government coup. Two weeks before the baby's birth, they had been in a government situation that was favorable to them, but then overnight it changed and now the people who were in power were sympathizers with Nazism. And here they are, Americans in the capital city. They had decided when the baby was born, if she was a girl, they were going to name her Beulah Joy. But when she was born, they named her Faith. Because they said, we have Nothing left but our faith. In one year's time, they had five major crises. The death of their son, Paul Sr. with a very serious disease. Literally, the roof caves in on their home. She has extreme difficulty with the pregnancy and then the government coup all in one year's time and shortly after that Paul senior began to feel a little bit better 
He was still so weak. And he fell to his knees and he prayed this way. He said, God, give me strength to go one more time to Timkomotu. Just once more. And God gave him strength. And he went back to the village and he preached the gospel. And this is when the church took root in Burkina Faso. They had effective ministry and then they traveled further south and they went into a, a complete different nation. And, and then after that, they went and did ministry in Japan. And later on in life, they went to Alaska to minister to the Eskimos. They were missionaries for many, many years. And now after decades and decades and decades pass, they finally go back to Burkina Faso. Paul got the chance to go and he's in his 80s when he walks into the city of Tincombotu and he sees at the church compound a man that he had mentored decades earlier named Dashu. Dashu comes running out, waving his hands, and he grasps the hands of the missionary, and together they begin to dance around in the African style. And Dashu says, missionary, it was worth it all, because now there are churches everywhere. Our general superintendent, George Wood, went to preach the 75th anniversary of Burkina Faso. On the closing night, there were 100,000 people in attendance who were followers of Jesus. And he closed his sermon quoting the words that had been preached by a seven-year-old dying boy decades earlier. Don't take Satan's road. Take Jesus' road. It is the road that will take you to heaven. There are people that have sacrificed because they believe that Jesus is the God-man. As we read on verse number 7 says, the Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. I'm drawn to these words by Pilate. Don't you realize these are powerful words. In fact, it's intended as a power play by Pilate. I'll pull rank on you, Jesus. You better submit or else. Pilate says, why are you being so quiet, Jesus? Cat got your tongue? Don't you have anything to say in defense of yourself? Don't you know that I have the authority that I could treat your life right now? And Jesus says to him, you wouldn't have any power unless it was loaned to you from above. I want to borrow Pilate's misguided question and place it before you this morning. Don't you realize? Don't you realize Jesus is your king? Verse number 12 is really quite remarkable. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend to Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. You know, peer pressure is one of the greatest tools that the enemy uses to get people to deny Jesus. Pilate wanted to free Jesus, but he couldn't quite bring himself to do it. Who knows, maybe with the passing of time after it's all over and decades have passed, I like to think that maybe after Pilate had the benefit of reflection and he could look back and think it all through and all the events of Jesus' life, perhaps, just maybe, Jesus set Pilate free at a later point in his life. I hope so. 
Verse 13 says this, when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away. Take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Gabbatha means the pavement. It's a raised porch. You can imagine this picture that we've shown this morning gives you a good image. This elevated porch, how beautiful and immaculate it must have been. The pavement and the beam of seat. It is the, the highest court. And Pilate judges Jesus at this court. No doubt you've seen the traffic sign that reads, No Stopping on Pavement. I want to tell you, there was no stopping on the pavement for Jesus. In other words, he could have stopped the pain. He, he could have stopped the torment and the agony and all of the anguish. At any point he could have, but he didn't. You know, Jesus didn't stop when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he realized that what was in front of him and he prays and said, Lord, take this cup from me. I, I don't want this cup. And yet, not my will, but your will. And he drank damnation dry. And here, in a similar way, before Pilate, Jesus didn't stop the taunting and the jabbing and the accusing, the slapping and mocking and ridiculing. He could have stopped it, but he didn't. No stopping on pavement. No stopping on Gabbatha. It's the point of no return. He is so resolute. He is intent on fulfilling his father's mission. <coughs> So Gabbatha is high above the people. It's the place of irrevocable sentencing. This is the appellate court. It's the highest court in the land. It's the judgment seat. The Bema. Don't you realize what Jesus has done for you? Don't you realize that he is your king. A number of years ago, one of our Assemblies of God missionaries was in India. And it's very, very hot. They have open air trains there and they still have them to this day. You can see them on television. No air conditioning, of course. The masses of people just fill those trains and squeeze in tight. They're riding along and, and the missionary notices up in front of him some commotion. What happened was there was a man who was literally about to pass out. He was, he was experiencing in that moment heat stroke. And, and uh, he, he was going limp. And someone recognized what happened. And, and they grabbed a cup of water and ran to this man and, and tried to get him to drink. And the man looked down desperately needing the water. But he saw the cup and saw the individual. And he refused the water. Somebody else looks on and they realize what had happened. They said, oh, it's because he's from a higher caste. You see, in India, they have a, a caste system. It's kind of a way of labeling all the different tribes of people. And some castes are higher in the social ladder than others. And here's this man desperately needing water, but he refuses to cut. He won't have it. Somebody else thankfully noticed that next to him was his own cup, so they took his own cup and ran and grabbed water and brought it to him. And then when he saw his own cup, 
Then he drank and revived. Same water, different cup. Don't dismiss Jesus because he doesn't come in the package you expected. Don't refuse to drink the living water just because you wanted a different cup. Don't you realize what Jesus has done for you? Don't you realize he is your king? Next week, we're going to honor all the missionaries we support who have gone beyond borders. This morning, I want to focus on telling you about one ministry that I'm so excited about. The brightest, most qualified, uh, the most gifted young people of the Assemblies of God Many of them are responding to the call of God to go and minister Jesus to Muslim people. They don't go as school teachers. I mean, they don't go as missionaries or evangelists or pastors. They can't. They have to go undercover. So they go as school teachers, orphanage directors, social workers, engineers, small restaurant owners. They do anything they can to have a day job so they can fly undercover and minister Jesus to Muslim people. It's called the Live Dead Initiative. Live Dead Initiative. It's based upon the verse from Philippians that says, I die to self and live for Christ. Why? Because they have determined, you know what, enough is enough. 41% of our world's population has not had an adequate gospel witness. So what they're doing is planting churches. They're taking teams of people into areas. Phase one was that they went into the Sudan, which is very risky, very dangerous, and planted a church there. Phase two is that they are now targeting to plant churches among 33 important port cities along the northern coast of the continent of Africa. 33 different cities where all of the commerce comes in. They want to plant churches for the Lord Jesus Christ in the enemy's territory. Phase three will be to plant churches in all the people groups of the Arab world. And they are seeing scores of Muslims come to Jesus to accept Him as Savior. But it is not without jeopardy. They are risking their very lives. Some of them have been imprisoned. Some of them have been in danger in various times. But they are doing it because they have determined this. Here's, here's the motto of the Live Dead Game. They believe if a Muslim would be willing to get in an airplane and fly it into a building as a radical because he is so committed, he believes something so much that he would die even though clearly he does not believe the truth. <clears throat> then why shouldn't we be willing to die if it takes it? Because very truth has died for us. Live Dead. I want to encourage you to like Live Dead on Facebook. I encourage you to follow the Live Dead blog uh, online. I believe that these individuals need our prayer covering because they are going into uncharted territory because they are fulfilling Matthew 24, 14. This gospel will be preached in all nations as a witness for my name's sake, and then shall the end come. Hey, what's the big idea? Here's the big idea. Here's the big idea of this message. It's simply, success is determined by obedience to God, to His will. Success is determined by obedience 
to God's will. That's how you define success. You see, Jesus didn't seem successful when he was being mocked in front of the angry crowd, wearing a fake robe and twisted crown, but he was very successful. Paul and Virginia Weidman, they didn't seem successful when they encountered death and devastation on the mission field in Burkina Faso, but they were very successful. You may not seem successful when you follow God's will. It may mean less money serving in obscurity without recognition in the shadows instead of the limelight. But if you are doing God's will, you are very successful. And I want to close by giving you the opportunity to be a successful human. If you are here and this morning you would admit that you are not truly in a right standing with Almighty God. Guess what? I don't care how successful you may be in business. I don't care how successful you might be among the popular crowd. If you have not given your life to Jesus Christ to truly follow Him, you are not successful. I want to give you the chance to be a successful human right now. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. And as I'm praying this prayer, that helps you, that leads you to Jesus. Why don't you just pray it along with me? If, if you need to get saved, if you need to recommit yourself to Jesus, then pray this with me right now. Dear God, forgive me. I've lost my focus. I've made other things seem so important when they were not important. I've gotten distracted by stuff and by pleasure and sometimes by money and other things. I have neglected you. You alone, oh God, are the most singular important person on this planet, in this universe. And, and, and I have forgotten you. Forgive me. I do want to be a successful human. I don't want to fail my assignment. So I come to you, Lord Jesus, right now. Heavenly Father, I receive your Son, Jesus Christ. I gained access to heaven because I believe that you are who you say you are, Jesus. And I turn from my wickedness and I turn to you. You are holy and righteous. <clears throat> Clean me up. Make me a new creation. I plan to follow you all of my life. From this very point forward, I plan to follow you every single day. Help me, Jesus. Amen. I want to ask you to be very reverent and keep your eyes closed, heads bowed. Except, if you just made peace with God, just right now, if you really prayed that prayer and you meant it in your heart, I would love to see who you are. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to single you out and have you come to the front or anything like that. But just by knowing that you made that decision, it helps me so much because I want to pray for you this week. So yes, I see you. If, if that's you, just slip your hand up and, and make eye contact with me, would you? Yes, I see you. God, God bless you. I see you. Amen. God bless you. Yes, yes, I see you. Do you know there have been eight adults who have raised their hand this morning? I wonder if there are not others. Do you need to make peace with God? This is a wonderful opportunity right now. So you guys that, that just raised your hand, some of you, it's a recommitment that you've made, and I'm, I am full on board with you. I'm supporting you. If you have not been baptized in water, we need to do that right away. Come talk to me. Tell me when you're ready. We need to do that soon. And then, please, please do. Let's get together because there's some steps that you can take that are going to help you so much in your walk with Jesus. You really need someone to come along with you and help you in this journey. 
right now we're going to shift gears by showing you a brief two-minute video while the video is playing.